Let's hit record. Excellent. So good morning. Good morning, everybody who's joined us. And good morning to my lovely friend, Holly, who is joining us from Mitchell Moors. But I'll let Holly tell you all about herself in a minute. Um, so I'm Halad. I'm from GL Law. I'm a solicitor and um, do all things, exciting things like wills and powers of attorney and trusts and estate planning and care and all the sort of things that people don't want to think about. Um, and I'm delighted that Holly is joining us today because Holly and I have, over the last sort of decade, spent a lot of time chewing the fat about all the things that we, we do in the sphere of care, capacity, court protection, wills, and what have you. And we thought, well, we think we're quite interesting. So we thought we might like to share the experience <laughs> with other people. So, <laughs> so very much what the intention is today is like, we're going to talk about some things that we've sort of come across recently and things that are bothering us and things that we can see that um, are going to be affecting our clients. And for those of you sort of here, here today, uh, no doubt, things that will be affecting people you come across so uh very happy to take conversation to take questions during the um course of the call um but we're going to aim for about 40 minutes uh chatting and then do a q a at the end so uh feel free to get stuck in so holly over to you hello <laughs> thank hello. you hi hi thanks everybody I am probably, unfortunately for you all, as chatty as Helen is, so <laughs> this could be a really, really noisy 40 minutes for you. Um, so yeah, um, I am um, Holly, Holly Meaven Hawkins, uh, it's always easy to remember me because I've got such an absurd name, uh, born with it, can't help it, um, and I am the Head of Mental Capacity at Mitchell Moores um, in Bristol, which is sort of how Helen and I know each other really, I guess. So I deal with all things mental capacity, but I have a, a particular... I don't know, inkling for, like of, love of, all things are really complex and go slightly wrong with sort of trustees, attorneys, disputes, uh, removal, gifting, IHT planning, wills, that sort of thing where it's got a mental capacity twist. Um, so yeah, that, that's my specialism, sort of more in the elder sphere than the injury sphere, but I do a bit of both anyway, so Helen and I have a good overlap I guess um so this could be quite an interesting half an hour I reckon <laughs> absolutely and I think yeah I think Ali you, you're right aren't you that we both of us started life as sort of private client lawyers and you know people just yeah. go oh it's wills and it's tax and it's probate and, you know maybe some trusts if you're, if you're that way inclined and both of us have found sort of as we're sort of going through our sort of careers that actually it really isn't that straightforward that people are no. complicated <laughs> and people's yeah. lives are complicated and you throw in you know lovely bits of legislation such as the uh, Mental Capacity Act and the Care Act over the last sort of um, sort of 15 years, and suddenly life is getting infinitely more interesting. So I know you've been um, more so than myself been involved in a lot of court protection cases, that, um, and I think the one that you know the most reported one was your sort of um, marriage one that yeah, you had. Absolutely. So I would and love to know more about about that because I think it really gives a flavour of, of you know where this gets a bit messy around the edges and what we can do. Yeah, I think that's it. And so I, when I joined Mitchell Moors, I joined about three, four months ago. I was at Foot Ants Day Straight and Able Law uh, for five or six years before that. And um, when I was offered the position, they said, oh, so you'll be head of the mental capacity group. And I thought, that's just corporate talk for team. Um, but actually, now I've arrived, I'm definitely head of the mental capacity group for exactly the reason that Helen was saying. And actually, mental capacity just sneaks into nearly every single area of our lives. It's not like, the people that lose mental capacity of only thinking about their will. Oh, have we lost Holly? In the middle of a horrible litigation case, they, they could be in the middle of a divorce, they could have childcare proceedings around them. That mental capacity just sort of flows into every single element of life. And um, and I've actually, when I now I'm in, in this role, I've been doing quite a lot of advising our, our litigators and our commercial litigation teams about what to do with people that lack capacity on the other side of litigation and our family teams as well. So um, it, as part of that, like, I think a lot of the time mental capacity lawyers try and sort of say, oh, I specialise in health and welfare, sort of like, you know, so doing deprivation of liberty proceedings, care proceedings, that sort of side of things, or I specialise in finance and affairs. And the court of protection like to split things up I guess in that way and say oh this is the pathway for property and affairs this is the pathway for health and welfare never the twain shall meet particularly now following our EACC which makes it almost impossible or really difficult for, for property and financial affairs deputies 
to actually work in the health and welfare arena. But actually, we all know that the lines are not clear. And, you know, as a deputy for finances, I will often be dealing with capacity for sex or capacity to um, go on the Internet and engage in social media and needing to get capacity reports. But a capacity report is essentially a health and welfare issue. So you need to get permission to do that capacity report. So life is complicated. Mental capacity is complicated. The world of corporate protection is hugely complicated. And the case that um, Helen was talking to me about uh, just a second ago was a case for ReDNM which is um, um, one of the leading cases and it's reported about two, three years ago now um, on capacity to marry. And we were approached by the would-be wife of P, um, who was an elderly gentleman in his 80s with Alzheimer's. And these guys have been together a really long time, like 25 years. And he had asked her to marry her quite a lot of times. And she said, no, 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 I'm not that sort of person. I don't want to be married. Um, and then eventually they decided to tie the knot. Um, but uh, then they got a mental capacity assessment saying, yep, he had capacity to, to get married. Um, and they tried to get married, but they found that there was um, a sort of like a, 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 a prevention put on, on the register, basically saying that they couldn't get married. And, 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 and the children from his former marriage applied for a forced marriage pre for a prevention order against uh, my client um, to try and stop her marrying him on the grounds that he lacked capacity to get married. Anyway, long story short, we had a case about it in the Court of Protection and what the case needed to look at was but basically they, the, the, the children were saying that he lacks capacity to get married because he doesn't understand that getting married will revoke his will. And the consequences of that are that wife-to-be will receive all of the estate rather than children will receive all of the estate, which is what previously was the situation. And so the case had to look at this exact issue that Helen is referring to, which is basically the interrelationship between capacity to marry and capacity to have sex, absolutely health and welfare, and capacity to make a will, and capacity to understand what the implications of getting married could be on your financial estate. So we had to look at uh, sort of similarities of capacity to divorce in terms of um, whether how much you need to understand about how much that might affect your estate when if you were to get divorced. Anyway. The judge took a very pragmatic view and he said that um, the, you need, to, obviously, Mental Capacity Act, you need to be able to understand the reasonably foreseeable consequences of deciding or failing to decide one way or the other, including um, the, the sort of anything that might reasonably occur as a result of that. And as far as he was concerned, yes, getting married means you have to understand that that will revo revoke your will, but P didn't need to understand the ins and the outs of the financial consequences in terms of the taxation implications that that would have on his estate because obviously it would reduce his taxation if he was to get married because he had the nil rate ban passing between man and wife um, and actually the implication would be that his daughters would be not disinherited but their, their inheritance would be significantly amended as a result of um of the marriage and the intestacy rules that apply as a result of that and then further to that, so further to that hearing, my client got married to her now husband, which is wonderful. And so it's a really, really great outcome. But then the statutory will proceedings happen, obviously, after that. So it's just like an almost an exact example of why the world that we live in is just so messy, but so brilliant and so fascinating all in one. And why what we do is so important, actually. Absolutely. And, and I think that the reason I sort of picked up on that one, because I just, it, for me, I always think about mental capacity work is a bit like, you know, unraveling a jumper. You pull up one yeah. thread and suddenly the whole wretched thing falls down, or it falls down because, as you say, in you, your client's case, well, you know, I've, I've, I've loved this woman. I want to get married. That's a nice thing. Yeah. Uh, capacity to get married fairly low bar you know uh, having had not not a reported case but having had a disputed uh, estate um where somebody got married uh, under interesting circumstances shall we say um mm. and yes but the capacity then to understand a will is another test and the capacity as you said the, the tests then and you suddenly start layering and layering and layering and it's suddenly like hang on there's more to this. There's more to this. It can become this. very complicated. It can become test. very complicated. And then really nice, as you say, to sort of hear that the court takes a fairly pragmatic approach because you're going to go, hang on, let's just take a step back because emotions run high. People who lack capacity um, or need care or often both, um, obviously, you know, things aren't always not well. <laughs> and there's always, you know, in, in court protection parlance, there's P and P's in the middle, but P always has a supporting cast. And it's often for me, it's that supporting cast and it's balancing all those up 
is really important and I think that I really like you know the the, the sort of way that you explain this it just overlays everything you can't compartmentalize <laughs> capacity into little neat boxes because it doesn't work like that I think the court of protection are regularly having to deal with this issue because you know in a sense individual tests for capacity are, are a sort of an academic creation because actually nothing is ever in its own box um, but the Court of Protection are regularly obviously facing new and novel situations and having to bring it back down to brass tacks and bring it back down to the test and bring it back and unravel and try and sort of like I don't know sort of like segue it down into lots of little tests rather than one ginormous test there's been quite a lot of cases in the last few months that have been published where quite a lot of different tests for capacity are dealt with because actually um you know life is complicated and I think as a result of re-ACC a lot more of these overlaps between health and welfare and property and affairs are going to be going to the court naturally mm. even if it's just for requesting um authority to act in a particular way or authority to incur costs in a particular way, the actual issues about capacity are going to be coming to the court of protection in a way that they weren't previously coming. So I think it's only going to get more complicated in the court rather than less complicated. Yeah. Talk a bit more about re-ACC, because when it came out, I read it and went, oh, I'm just going to sit back with the tea and watch this roll out. So <laughs> I did the opposite. I decided, I don't know, I just, you know, I'm just such a glutton for punishment. I just decided, I read the case and went, that's not good enough. <laughs> I don't get it. I need to understand this. So in the way that my brain works, I then just spent a day. Oh, God, it was such it was a hot day as well, because I know it was one of those hot early spring days. It came out in like March or came out in February and then at the beginning of March. I remember sitting in this garden room being really hot and trying to get a, a flow diagram sorted because this is oh, how my brain works. Interesting. OK, yep. <laughs> no, it's my approach to it. And I did the same with incapable trustees when I was nearly qualified. Because I was like, like I, I know I'm either going to fight myself every single time I read this case and work out like how to get to the end of it. Or I just need to take the time to sit and work out a flow diagram. So I put a flow diagram together. And then I realised that I wasn't going to be the only person in the country worrying about ReACC and how it works. So I thought, because I, I'm on the Law Society Wills and Equity Committee, I, I sort of reached out to SFE. Um, I can see we've got Lash, Lakshmi here on the, on the call. And I reached out to Professional Deputy Forum, and I reached out to STEP, um, and I reached out to Copper and said, look, I think we're going to need some guidance for the profession here on the ACC. Otherwise, we're all going to just sit in our studies and cry, because it was about the time, obviously, that COVID happened as well. And yeah, we I, 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 I confess, unlike you, in, you know, I, I just went cold flannel time, I'm just going to leave, <laughs> leave, that one for, leave that for the moment. <laughs> Leave that for Holly to uh, sort out. Um, and anyway, so we got together and we put, we put together some guidance on how we interpreted ReACC and sort of how it should work and also a slow diagram on it. Um, so to try and sort of demystify it a little bit. And that's freely available from all of the, the, um, the, the professional organisations that I, that I just described. And we actually went to her on a judge Hilda and said to her, look, are you happy with this? Because this is only our interpretation. And she said, I can't endorse or not endorse it, but I'm happy for you to send it out. And thank you very much for working together as organisations to prepare this. So we actually now stay together as a sort of unofficial, we still call ourselves the ACC team, even if not. <laughs> but actually we keep looking at the things that are coming up and so sort of ongoing yep. for the profession and, and having a joint approach to it. Um, so ACC was obviously a case that, um, the, 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 there was lots of different questions that were raised in the case, but what's come out of it is a set of guidelines uh, for, for property and affairs deputies in terms of when they are able to act without permission and with permission from the Court of Protection, particularly with regards to litigation and health and welfare matters. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and also when you're instructing people from your own firm, um, and also further when, when you're allowed to act as a litigation friend and not. And I won't go into every single outcome here because actually there's loads of different outcomes, but the um, I would refer you to the flowchart, but I think the key thing to, to take away from it is if you're going to be instructing someone, if, you, if, if it's within your authority, like it's within your deputyship order, it's something you'll be dealing with every day, like, oh, I don't know, as getting a tenancy or seeking uh, employment law advice or something. If you're going to be instructing your own firm and the firm's get, and, and the fee's going to be over £2,000 in any one deputyship year for that issue, then you need to be seeking quotes from elsewhere so that you're making sure that actually you're acting in the best interest of your client in instructing your firm. It's not just a default that you can instruct your own firm. 
Additionally, if it's litigation, which means anything letter of claim onwards or receiving a letter of claim onwards, then you need to have authority to engage in that litigation because the, the authority of a deputy doesn't extend to litigation. Um, equally, the extent that the authority of a deputy doesn't extend to health and welfare matters. So you need to seek authority to deal with a health and welfare matter. And um, that would include um, trying to, or maybe something, an issue like capacity to have sex or capacity regarding moving um, or, or something like that. There's obviously loads of different issues about capacity in terms of health and welfare. Um, and so, yeah, so basically it's quite it's quite a difficult judgment to read because it means that actually there's going to be a lot more applications that are made um, as a result of it and actually cost to pay. But it was a real assertion of actually your deputyship authority is quite limited and deputies were extending it a little bit all the time. And so it was a sort of bringing it back down to brass tacks and what, what a deputy is allowed to do. And I think it's really interesting because one of the things that sort of I'm sort of seeing and you know anecdotally is the sort of like well you know an attorneyship and a deputyship is the same thing <laughs> and it, it, it's that sort of notion that people are going well I've got this bit of paper this is this is an age-old problem I've got this bit of paper that I can just do what, what you know my incapacitated person could do yeah and actually no there are limitations on it and then they are there are increasing layers and layers and layers of complexity on, yeah on, on on what you can and can't do and you know as you say it's you know re-ACC is professional deputies but you sit there and think well hang on this isn't bad you know ways of applying it if you're an attorney or you, you well know, I'm not so. sure that that is the case actually I, I think re -AC, I, I think what I look at deputyships and attorneyships as as whilst there are a lot of overlaps in terms of the rights and the authorities and, and the obligations on the two of them I, I view them as very different starting points okay and I don't know if, if, how you feel about this. We've never discussed this before. <laughs> this could but, get interesting. <laughs> oh, God, I'm making myself on the line here. But actually, like, if you think about it, the Court of Protection are the body that have the authority to make decisions about a person that lacks mental capacity. They are delegating that authority by making a deputyship order. Okay, mm -hmm. so the deputy is only allowed to do the things that are said in that order because those are the things that have been delegated and ultimately the authority still lies with the Court of Protection, but they're saying for administrative ease, we'll allow you to make X, Y, and Z decisions on our behalf. And um, because it'd be impracticable for you to come back to us every time. Obviously for health and welfare side of things, they don't really do that. They try and keep that authority with the Court of Protection. Like you don't mm. really get very many health and welfare deputies because actually there are lots of small decisions to be made all the time because of, because actually health and welfare and um, decisions can be made on a, less interest basis by health and welfare um, care providers and actually when there's a big decision to be made they like it to go back up to the court of protection mm. for that reason powers of attorney don't stem from the same logical basis powers of attorney stem from the basis that p is giving all of their authority to somebody else for them to step into their shoes in terms of all of the things that they could do so so starting from a point of sort of liberation almost you're starting from a point of everything and yes you can then step into my everything whereas the court are starting from the point of nothing but then allowing the deputy to do x y and z so and i think cases like a reacc really shine the light on that distinction because if you look at sort of whilst it doesn't actually say it in a lasting power of attorney can a can an attorney take a loan probably because P, the donor, could have taken a loan. Mm. And then there's no, unless there's a restriction. So basically, I start from the point of everything with a power of attorney, unless it's restricted. Start at the point of nothing from a deputy, unless it's authorised. So there's sort of like, I see them as opposing starting points. What about That's, you? <laughs> I, I, no, do you know what? I think you've convinced me because I've, I've always been a bit like, well, hang on, surely you know, the, the, the Mental Capacity Act is legislation and the court protection is, is fleshing things out and OPG decisions and, you know, fascinating as they are. And every time I read them and I go, okay, this has come to court because it's quite a, it, it's of sufficient importance and, and bothered somebody enough that they want to take it all the way and then you know we get the judgment um I, but I've always been a bit like well I, you know I've if you like felt that sort of attorney stuff has sort of gone under the radar yeah because you know you've got powers of attorney being created for a pastime you know we're all we're all at it and we're all telling people it's a really good idea but we're giving people pretty powerful bits of paper and are we giving them the toolkit to do it um, no I don't think we are and I think that people 
I think people think that deputyships and attorneyships are essentially the same because they, 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 they broadly allow you to do the same things, whereas attorneys are significantly less supervised than deputies and they have significantly more power than deputies. Mm. So actually, there's almost like doubly dangerous attorneyship, but yeah. at the same time, they are doubly useful because they can do, attorneys can do loads more things. If you just look at the stats from, I'm actually in the middle of writing a presentation at the moment on um, attorneyship and, and deputyship removal. And I just, I just thought I might share some stats with you because I love stats. Um, so basically in 2018, 2019, the APG launched 2,883 2, safeguarding investigations, which is 54% up on the previous year. Um, and they made 721 applications to the court for attorney or deputy removal, which was 55% up on the previous year. And I wow. think those stats show you actually, yeah, OK, so we've got this attorneyship and deputy system in place. But actually, maybe there does need to be a bit of a, a review maybe on how attorneys are managed and, and, and supported and the guidance that they are given, because they've got a lot of power and more, I think, than deputies. And it, it's quite easy to misuse, even by accident. And actually, I was looking at the cases for preparing this 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 talk. And actually, like a lot of the cases are people that are sort of accidentally doing the wrong thing. They just don't know yes. what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Um, and and, it, and in a way, that's even more the case for deputies because obviously they're only allowed to do what's in the order. And so they might actually accidentally do something that an attorney could do and they assume they could do, but actually mm. they're not allowed to do. Um, such as sell a property or something like that because obviously you're only allowed to sell a property if the order says you are and the court yeah. protection have said that they are not planning on having the ability to buy and sell property as a default part of a, of a deputyship they you have to actually ask for that to be put in whereas an attorney can obviously sell and buy property as a default yeah I, I, and it, it is interesting isn't it because like you know as somebody who does lots of powers of attorneys with people and says look, look you're, you're you're taking control of this it, you know you're having the conversation you're having the discussions with your attorneys to make sure they do the right thing and you know give them as much information as you can think about doing but you know do bear in mind that you there is this overriding legal you know obligation on you and you know do make sure you you know don't go out with that authority and you know generally that's working well when talking to clients and you know but that's me talking to a client from the perspective of i'm a solicitor and i'm quite bothered about this <laughs> yeah uh you know i think you know the 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 infamous conversation that i we inevitably have is i want power attorney for my mum and i go well oh, i hate want? that i hate that it makes me so <laughs> angry when clients come to like, me and ask i want to take out i oh my sister took out power of attorney for my dad no, she didn't. No, <laughs> well, no, dad didn't. granted power of attorney to your sister. Sorry. It is not <laughs> just a piece of paper. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I mean, I confess at this point, I did my own power attorney using the online system because I was like, That's I'm not a go. problem. It's okay. You are allowed, <laughs> are allowed to use the online system. <laughs> Phew. Um, you know, because I was like, oh, I just want to see how easy this mm -hmm. is. And I was like, that was terrifying. Yeah, that was oh, really? terrifying. Well, easy. It was so easy. It was so yeah, easy. You still have to print it out and sign it, but obviously I, the APG at the moment are trying to. If you want to get onto it, um, <gasps> okay, we'll on yes, it. let's do it. Let's let's move on to the next bugbear. <sighs> My next page. <laughs> like, this is just like a tour of things that annoy me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, fair. <Beth. laughs> um, okay, so obviously the APG are. Um, are, are trying to do a reform when well, they are reforming lasting powers of attorney and if you have not responded to the uh the consultation the deadline is the 13th of october please 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 can you reply to the consultation because the first question is should we be reviewing the role of a witness do we need a witness at all why not get rid of the idea of a witness no. let's just make them paper contracts let's just call them expressions of wishes Let's not make sure that they are deeds and actually have proper legal standing alongside, you know, mortgages and wills. Let's just call them bits of paper. Why not? Um, or not bits of paper. Um, so you can see I'm somewhat irritated by the by, by the consultation. Um, My response was just don't. <laughs> just, <no. laughs> just, just even if you only reply to that first question, please can I urge you to reply to that first question because it's so important that the APG understand. The professional concerns. I'll, do, I'll, I'll circulate the link to everybody who's here today and who you know so we'll make sure that you know they've got the access to that so yeah I know SFE um that their, their um their, their response has been prepared by um Holly Chantner who um is equally as vocal as I am on such issues and we've we've discussed it and we are 
at one. <laughs> so it's good. Hopefully, SFE and Law Society's responses will be hand in hand. So, but it, it is terrifying, and I think it is that. So, well, I've got this literally a bit of paper, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I say I did my power attorney, and I went and sat down, and I went right then, husband, you know, you need a power attorney. You went, yes, yes, that's fine. <laughs> did it and then I, 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 I like you are you are going to listen to me now and explain to you what it is I'm doing but I was like it could have been very easy to just have done it printed it and and, and, here, and, sent it. and you know my husband is not vulnerable my husband is not somebody who, who has got who has got any sort of you know anybody uh, after his after his his wealth you know unless anybody wants a sort of a slightly extensive collection of comics um you know <laughs> and I was like oh my god this is just too easy yeah and it's going to be made even easier because uh, they are very much what their other recommendation is is that you're allowed to do it via online identity basically so no need for a signature um they I mean we're trying because I've I've been part of loads of workshops over this over the summer on behalf of the Law Society and just explaining to the APG that yeah okay I get it you've got brilliant methods of identifying people like that a foolproof you know because Metro Bank have been fantastic in leading the way at getting EID systems in place like no one's arguing that we can absolutely tell who a person's identity is without them actually physically having to see a person's listers do it all the time you know mm-hmm. e-identity checks but that doesn't mean that it's actually that person giving the authority on the day there's a big difference between ID and signing because someone can just get someone's ID like yes. and I it's just right you can still be hugely fraudulent even though the person exists um and also you know I'm really concerned that you know that the people that are making LPAs are not digital natives like if you found it complicated a lady I, I'm gonna say mid-30s had a um you know a lady in their Thanks. mid-30s and you know as a digital native um, you know, if you found it complicated and you found yourself thinking, oh God, I'm not 100% sure of this, even though A, you're completely from my film computer every day and you printed it out so you could put your signature on it. Imagine it was someone in their 80s that was not, I mean, computers were invented when they were in their 40s or 50s. Do you yeah. know I mean? And they probably haven't really ever used one for work or anything like that. And then they don't even get it printed out. It's all online. Imagine how intimidating that would be and how easy it would be to. But well, to, to, to force someone into signing an LPA or get them to a position where there's no knowledge and approval. And it's um, a knowledge and yeah. approval point, I think, that that is really important. And it's back to the bugbear of I want <laughs> I want power attorney for mum or my sister got power attorney for dad. So, hang on. <laughs> Subtle yeah. but important distinction. And actually the the the, the proposals to me, are, like you, I'm not a fan, are riding roughshod over yeah. some ba- fairly basic safeguards some fairly important issues that, that you know people need to just be aware of that you know would you give you know would you give somebody a blank check no. in, in old school you know or would you say please come into my house take what you want because I trust I think, you I think the thing is is and I think the public guardian they get quite frustrated with the law profession because they think that we think that everything needs to be signed you know with quills and that we're all just after the money for like advising on a power of attorney as I always try to explain to them like we barely make we I don't think we make any money on making a lasting power of attorney it's essentially a lost leader that like you just basically cover your costs if you're lucky and you do it really well and the people are really quick about what they want I make all my money from everything going wrong that's where I basically that, that's why I am a lawyer because because I essentially get paid when powers of attorney have been incorrectly created and people are arguing about that power of attorney and the, the wrong person's acting and they're doing the wrong thing and they're being fraudulent about it and they need to be removed and there's a deputy needs to be appointed like that's where I make my money so I would much rather people actually get proper advice and I never have to see an LPA dispute again that would be my absolute preference I'm just trying to explain to the APG that actually we would much rather make much less money and have elder people just looked after and things not go wrong than, you know, than have a business, a thriving business of attorney disputes and attorneys acting badly. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's also a really important point. And then you said, you know, you're a Mitchell Moore's now and you sort of, you know, you had a mental capacity, which is great, and you know, all power to your elbow. And actually, those, those of you here today wondering why are we with two solicitors from different firms, it's like, it's okay, we do talk, we do actually engage with each other because having these conversations is really important because you're going to go I just sanity san- san- check something with you and have you come oh, across 100%. this and, you know I'm referring you a case later I was about <laughs> literally the reason I was slightly late for this is because I had a call on a contested matter that's about to blow up 
And uh, I was like, oh, I know the person for the job. And I was about to email you. And I was like, oh, God, this is 11 o'clock. I need to get on the call. Um, exactly. So, and, and, you know, and it happens. So you need to be able to trust the people that you are on the other side with, that they're going to give proper, good advice. And actually um, then that's always in the best interest of P because then you know that it can get resolved, hopefully, out of court in a sensible way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that you're saying about power of attorney, court protection and the, the, the distinction. And <laughs> for me, you know, the, the, there's, the, the vast sort of change that I've seen is the sort of the real increase in sort of professional deputy ships off the back of clinical negligence claims. And that's a whole different breed of stuff compared to the sort of somebody's, you know, um, got their LPA wrong or they haven't done it properly or, you know, there's a deputy ship where, you know, the paperwork isn't in place because those who've got money from an injury claim have a very distinct place in society and there's a whole other ball game there isn't there it's the people who actually probably that I come across more and probably you know you do as well is that sort of actually where something has not so catastrophic has happened perhaps there has been a, a cognitive decline or there has been you know a, a catastrophic stroke for somebody you know it, it's just a freak incident it's not a, it's not as a result of an injury or a, a, a negligence and therefore there's a whole load of money off the back of it it's that people who've built up their own assets and built up their own lives and then the catastrophes happened and it's those people I think that that's where the, the bit for me the biggest vulnerability is because you've got yeah. sort of like you know uh, you know my husband was fine and then he went out for a bike ride and he had a, 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 a sort of a non-fatal aneurysm mm -hmm. and suddenly whoa where do I even begin and yeah. it's for that that for me I think you know in a sense the sort of PI clinic type stuff I think people all power to people you know who are doing it they're doing an excellent job yeah it's those people who are in that sort of actually you didn't know you didn't want you didn't know you're going to find yourself in this space because something's yeah. happened quite quickly yeah you, you know it's those people I, I, I feel that are vulnerable I think they're the ones that you know that where the power of attorney the deputy ship stuff is a really grey mixed area and uh, and people are at risk of getting it wrong and um, Back yeah. to your sort of married your marriage um case it's that isn't it it's that sort of we were ticking along and you know we were having this life and then suddenly i've got a i found myself embroiled in a in the court of protection, in the court protection. which is slow court as well and a, and a in a demanding court to be in as well i think but for many I, reasons yeah and i i think you know sort of for me the sort of in my head and simplistic is this you know people who sort of are ending up in the court protection and deputy ship sphere because there's been a clinical negligence or injury, have probably been through a court case or been through a, a process already. They've kind of become accustomed to... Battle-hardened. <laughs> Battle-hardened. It's those who find themselves there unexpectedly. Mm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And almost through no fault of their own either, because the world has just turned that way. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's, that, it's, the, it's that complexity that has pass them by because why would they know why would you know that you know what's happened with the court protection and the medical capacity act and re-acc and yeah. you know gladys meek and, and all, all these names that you know yeah, i absolutely. you and i can sit and go yep it's all there back of my head yeah i've got a good friend um a lady called hillary Cragg down at nash and co do you know her i do yeah so she's just published a book um so again we're just going to publicize each other because actually frankly <laughs> This is the world we live in. It's quite bizarre. I think other law, uh, other professions don't quite get it. Other other elements of being a lawyer. <laughs> anyway, she just published a book on on sort of living with dementia actually, and sort of how you can help people that have got dementia and how to communicate with them, how to support them. And she's doing a psychology degree because actually, so much of her job she has found over the years, and as a solicitor specialises in mental capacity and elder people, is actually just helping people get through that moment yes. and sort of putting the scaffolding in place for them to be able to actualize their wishes and, and put in place a world that works for them and suits them and a care regime that works for them financially affordable getting people the care in place that, that, that they need and actually there was a big overlap between um well not social work because I wouldn't say that I was a social worker but um I've got, got a question come up I talk about all these things that I'm really interested in and suddenly I talk about somebody else's book. <laughs> oh, Graham. Of course, I'll send you the link. Um, but no, um, yeah, and it's all, and it's actually like a huge amount of what we do is is um, just, it's about just being with people. And I, I always say, people say, why are you a mental capacity lawyer? And it's like, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Helen, it's I couldn't do another job. Like 
I don't think that there is another job that exists that I could that I could do one that I could probably be a barmaid in like Bali I could probably do that but like in terms of like a profession like I just feel like it called me like there was no option but to do this for me when I was like what am I gonna do with my life I was like well I'm gonna go and be a lawyer to help people that have got mental capacity issues because I, I don't I didn't really see another way of approaching my life do you know what I mean I went into law to do this so I think it takes us it, it takes a particular kind of person that just loves people really and that's why we do it absolutely and, and I think you know it's the, what the sort of analogy I always use is like you know think of us a bit like Mary Poppins we just have a large carpet bag of stuff we can do <laughs> You yes, just have to ask yes. us and then we'll go turfing through and go, hang on, <laughs> how does this, how does this fit? So yeah, I, you know, completely all the things you said and, you know, um, all very much where we are, but I did promise we would do 40 minutes and open up the floor to anybody who wants to throw anything at us. Um, otherwise we will, as you can tell, probably quite happily chat for, you know, for Britain. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anybody got anything they want to ask me or Holly at the moment? Or, you know, do you want to put it in the chat? Or, you know, we are, we are open to, you know, open to being quizzed. <laughs> yeah, I'll pop your link in. Yeah, there you go. Brilliant. Okay. So, okay. So, yeah, I think, you know, Hillary's great. Hillary's a fascinating person, as you say, with her thing. If we're, we're going to you know, go around shouting about people who are great, Marjorie Creek is also marvellous because Marjorie's an ex-nurse. And actually an oh, ex-nurse turned lawyer. That's interesting. Fascinating. Fascinating yeah. lady. And I heard her talk at um, Brace. So Brace a Dementia Charity, I used to be a trustee until very recently. And she came and spoke to Brace about her journey from being a nurse <laughs> to being a lawyer and how yeah. those two things work together I know two other nurse lawyers as well you've got Bernadette McGee that was at Mitchell Wars and I can't remember where she's gone now but she was a midwife and um, now she does brain injury cases um which I find quite fascinating um and then there's um oh what's she called Frances Letchford and she was an ex-ICU specialist nurse at Enable yes. Law but now does brain injury cases and I just think there's that a really, really interesting overlap there in terms of having an insight into both sides of the fence, if you see what I mean. And it, it, so. it is that. And it's, a, you know, to come back to this notion of collaboration, it's like, you know, I, I've not been, I've never been a nurse. <laughs> but, you know, Frances, I used to work with Frances. And, you know, <laughs> just listening to her stories and she's, you know, and that, that like, I'm a nurse. I don't have time to sit and think about these things. When I became a lawyer, well, you can sit down, you can have some time to think about it, you can go for a walk around the garden and you can come back. You, know, you have to make fast decisions in medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is where um, the, I think there's, there's tension uh, between the medical profession and, and, and lawyers about, you know, about the Mental Capacity Act and, and all these, these toolkits in the sense of um, how they work. Because, you know, we, we, we talk about, powers of attorney we talk about for finance and for health and deputy ships for what is and isn't delegated authority haven't touched on advanced decisions you know um and, and the and Jehovah's Witness case from earlier on this week indeed in, indeed uh, and you know w- w- the conversations about CPR I mean you know we talk about COVID last year and we've had co- you know conversations about you know sort of blanket CPR bans you know, or blanket CPR orders on people. Yeah. People, hang on, I didn't, I didn't agree to yeah. that, or my mum didn't agree yeah. to that. And, That's interests. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, no, I, I agree. And, and you, you know, and you can absolutely see that sort of like, well, hang on. I, as a lawyer, I've got, you know, I can, I've got all this stuff in my head about law, about you know, the law and what you can and can't do, and these bits of paper we can produce out of a bag and go, well, this gives me this authority and this gives me this authority. But how useful is it, you know, in in a crisis? you know over, yeah, over I think the way that our brains work is very helpful at the moment I it's just as clients I've got a pilot and I have a doctor a surgeon and the way that their brains work because they are people that deal with all of the problems immediately quickly and done yes. it's very interesting compared to how my brain works which is okay so this is this is the situation these are the problems that we've got these are the problems I think are the most important problems that we need to deal with now. And these are the solutions that we've got that mm. could potentially approach them. And this is how they'll affect those, those issues there. They get quite frustrated with me because they're just like, let's just sort it out. <laughs> I'm just like, well, no, actually, you know, and I think that the legal brain has got a 
a, a lot to offer and the legal training has got a lot to offer but equally the different training that medics and sort of you know people that are on that front line go through mm. is a very important training as well the way we approach things is very different mm. absolutely so we've got a question from Karina which says uh quick question when do you tend to get involved in a later life case at what stage do you tend to get involved oh as early bit, as possible bit. please when they're two <laughs> years old I'd like to get involved <laughs> I was going to say when somebody thinks to call us, <laughs> you know, because it, it's, I hate it's very much involved when the COP five has been received. You know, when when the application, like you know, you've got three days left until the court of protection deadline for response. So that's when not to get a lawyer involved. Not to get involved. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I'm I'm firmly in it, and this is what you know, being a lawyer. I'm like, you know, well, people tend to talk to their friends, their family, the man down the pub. Somebody oh, might yeah. eventually think they'll talk to a lawyer, and it's usually, as you say, sort of uh, thirty seconds before something needs to be done. Um, there we go. Um, Andrew Stinchcombe, uh, in relation to the elderly couple who had capacity to marry, am I right? He did not have capacity to make a will. What happened about a new will? I can't remember if it's public or not in the case. I can't say um, without checking the, 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 the judgment whether or not it was said whether he had capacity to make a will or not. But what I will say is a statutory will application was made. Do you want to talk a little bit about statutory will application? Okay, a statutory you know? will application is made where someone lacks capacity to make a will. So I can say that the capacity to make a will is uh, slightly higher than the capacity to get married. Um, so in order to have capacity to make a will, you need to be able to understand the um, nature and effect of making a will, understand the extent of your assets, understand the calls of the beneficiaries on your estate, and then also not have any insane delusions in relation to the same. Lovely case from the 1870s, Banks and Goodfellow. Um, and so actually that requires slightly more of the person than having capacity to marry, which is just that you understand that marriage is a contract and you will have a level of obligation towards the person who you are marrying. And then there, there'll probably be a sexual element. Well, that's just been debated, actually. There's been a case recently saying that there doesn't necessarily have to have a sexual element to marriage. Um, so it's a slightly lower, lower, lower test. So yeah, when, you, when you've got capacity to marry but not make a will, which is happening um, at the moment, which is why um, there's a big campaign at the moment against predatory marriages, because people are getting married to people then becoming their intestate beneficiary and then they can't make a will to change that um then you have to go down the statutory will route which is making an application to the court of protection for a will to be made for the person um in under new terms and it can be quite a long and costly procedure it takes about eight months to a year really yeah and I, I, I think you know the the the, the will test is multi-pronged <laughs> the yeah. sort of you know the, the capacity to marry is actually as you say is it con you know i'm marrying that person it's contract i'm gonna look after them which is sort of the marriage vows yeah essentially and like some people say that the marriage contract the, 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 is too low the test for capacity to marry but actually when you look at the history and cases on it it's all about respecting a person's autonomy to live the life that they want to live and to have that companionship because that companionship to many people with learning disabilities in particular elderly people is it's worth more than any money that they may have ever had you know actually you can't put a price on love and companionship um, and so that's why the cases have always uh, done the side of actually let's give people the liberty to be able to be with who they want to be with. Maybe the law about marriage needs to change in terms of actually it doesn't revoke your will rather than the test for capacity to marry. Um, because which I, you know, which I think, you know, just thinking out loud now, I think has to be better because I think that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> OK, yes. You, you know, as I, I always say to people, you know, there's there's a difference between a wedding and getting married. Getting married is a legal thing. Weddings are big parties, so you know. <laughs> but yeah. you know, if you are married, there are a whole load of things that sort of flow off the back of it. Yeah. And there's all sorts. You know, if you divorce, you then sort of you know in into the realms of what sort of what sort of provision should be made for for spouse and you, you know protecting family assets and inheriting assets. And I mean, I had a sort of um, sort of very sad situation. You know, where we had um somebody who was estranged from his wife who'd gone and uh, found somebody else didn't get around to signing the sort of paperwork for divorce proceedings and then had one of those catastrophic illnesses yeah. and dropped down dead that's it yeah and then they are still the the, the beneficiary. they are still yeah. the spouse and it's like yeah. and the family just could not get their head around they're like but, but they weren't together anymore and i'm like i know no. but they were still married and until you've yeah. unpicked or severed that contract and likewise but I've lived together with, you know, my partner for the last 50 years. What difference does it make? Well, well in law, I, uh, it in does. Law, and I a think, lot. yeah, it's probably a, a world, uh, uh, there is probably a call for 
for a reform in terms of how marriage and wills interact with each other. And in and it, to me, it just strikes you as, as perfect flowchart material. <laughs> uh, I'd love a flowchart. I mean, obviously, I do have the intestacy flowchart on my wall right now. You're not surprised to know. I'm like, not surprised can't to live know. Without it. <laughs> Um, you know, and yeah, I, I, I think, you know, like, like, like you, I think, you know, sort of capacity stuff is just through like, like a golden thread through all the things that we do, you know, whether you're doing family law, whether you're doing, you, you know, contract law, whether you're doing, you know, anything, actually, the, 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 these things happen and catastrophes do happen, you know, we all know. And, and actually, I've got a colleague of mine who says, I was banging on about this, and we were talking about shareholders' agreements. Um, and I said, you know, we need to make sure your shareholders' agreements have a, have a capacity clause. Oh, goodness, that is <laughs> the bane of my life, that is, Maitland. <laughs> and partnership agreements that don't yeah. have a capacity clause in them. So, like, you've just got this director or this partner it's just sort of, like, hanging about, and no yeah. one can remove them, and they can't do anything. It's a disaster. It was, and, and so, so I, was, I was banging, I was banging my drum about, you know, why we need to like do, you know, if you're even if you're a company and commercial lawyer, you need to have all this in place. And they went, oh, okay, yeah. they went, so actually being dead's easier than losing capacity. Oh, definitely. And I went, yep, yeah. well done. Didn't they went, die, definitely. Yeah, I said, you know, if you, you know, actually, if you've got somebody in the business with you, you probably, you know, you hope that that's the end of that, really, because the consequences of your business are, are, are quite significant, um, you know, and. I, I, you know, this is this was a sort of you know public, um, you know, we, I, I had um, clients and there were two brothers farming partnership. One punches the other one and kills him. Okay. <laughs> uh, great. And so partnership just dissolves. Yes. But there was nothing in place for anybody to continue to run the business. Mm. There was no structure in place because okay, it's just the informal partnership that's a, it was that's just the informal partnership and so you, you know we we had sort of um you know there was all sorts of disasters and, and you think gosh you know just these things might happen they might not happen and you know and that was a particularly tragic a, a incident but the consequences were catastrophic and we've had other clients you know sort of where they've been in business and you know skiing accidents I mean Michael yeah. Schumacher is a classic example oh, for that isn't he yeah. you know and he didn't expect that and no, no one expects that you would always expect the unexpected so. yeah uh, and so you know it, it's, it's getting that word out going you know you need to think about this you know, I know it's not I know it's not fun and I know it's not you know no, I need to do it I haven't I haven't got an LPA can you believe that <gasps> I know I know I should it. admit it should I but even <laughs> my brother who nearly died five years ago in a car crash and has a severe brain injury you know and he had that happen when he was 26 and we had absolute hell trying to access his bank account still with his insurance issues <laughs> i still don't have an lpa it's utterly unacceptable isn't I, it? I don't I know have... what, i don't know what else you need <laughs> i know i know that it's just it's just time isn't it? i have got wills because i worry that if my if i was to die then my children need to be looked after yeah. and obviously my life insurance is sorted and all that sort of side of things but um haven't made enough yeah I guess I, I I think I worry about other people more than I worry about myself probably so I need to sort it out really and it, it, um, it's, it's, a, it's a you know you, you, your story you, you know you you know the entire doubt you know what happened with your brother and even then you, you actually getting my oh, affairs in order sat down on Sunday hard. evening like I'd rather watch Antiques Roadshow and have lost wine than sort out my <laughs> LPA but like I will do it. I've just been a bit busy, but everyone says that. I know. I know. And my, my, my conclusion was um, very much a case of, well, if, I, if I've done it, then I could be quite smug telling other people to do it. Precisely. I know. I need to do it. I know. I know. I need so, to, but I'm, there's I your incentive. To I'm aware of that. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Graham, it is, it is a best for the thing you <laughs> Tell you what, Holly, you know, uh, you can try out the OPG system. Why don't you do system. mine for me, Helen? <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll work for food. <laughs> Come round for dinner. <laughs> my Absolutely. No, sit there. No, just sit there and sign me. <laughs> How bored our husbands would be. <laughs> yes. I think I think they're both they're both uh, they both know by now. You know, it's like yes, just go. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, yeah, any more? Have we got any more questions in the box? No, not at the moment. So um, any, Holly, anything that we haven't touched on? I'm mean, loads we haven't touched on, but you know, uh, we've got yeah, just delays and court of protection. I thought I'd give an update on that actually. Um, in terms of, I say, we, I don't know if anyone else was at the professional deputy forum event in Bristol last week. Um, we had a real life 
conference with 150 people. Wow. It was so overwhelming and so wonderful all at once. I just didn't quite know what to do with myself. I was like <laughs> flying around like, oh, it's so nice to see you. And then like going into room 10 minutes, like, 10 minutes on my own, just being like, I can't go with the amount of people. I think that's how we're all going to feel when we go back into the world again. Um, but there, um, her, unjust, uh, her other justice, Hilda, was there and she uh, gave them an update on the court protection waiting times and they are coming down slightly um, to sort of more like the 30 week to 40 week turnaround for, an, for a deputy order. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> turnaround for a deputy order. But um, there has been a really successful pilot uh, for uh, deputy ship applications and that's with a couple of firms around the country at the moment where they are both e-submitting which is working okay. really well so everything's going through like a portal but also um doing the 20 a's and 20 b's at the same time as submitting the application okay. so you don't then have to have that weight basically because a lot of the delay comes from having to match the 20 a's and 20 b's with the deputy of application and that actually takes a lot of manpower so the hope thing that this pilot will be rolled out but it won't be immediately because there's got to be changed the rules for it to happen but it's, that's i thought good progress actually from the court and good creative thinking and that's interesting, isn't it? That, that, that actually it's the administrative burden yeah. that is a problem, not not yeah. the sort of theory or the or the law. It's actually yeah. I'm trying to marry Just a bit of paper people. with another bit of paper, mm. and that's why it's going to take you 16 weeks to do something. Yeah. Exactly, they don't have enough manpower, but they've taken on a load more staff as well. So, yeah, so hopefully things are heading in the right direction. But just thought I'd update you. Oh, that's very useful. That is very useful indeed. Um, yeah, and I, I think you know we we, you know, we haven't even touched on social care and the care cap. And- oh, yeah, oh. and the other thing I was going to say, update wise, just as a an alert for everybody that works in the court of protection, that tomorrow obviously is the day that our rates change. So make sure that you've got your letters done. Um, we retain the letters to change it, obviously in line with the revised rates that have been approved and um, not post PLK, because obviously the MOJ would not have been impacted by PLK, but. Um, just in terms of their own review that they were carrying well, out. In well, indeed, indeed. So that is excellent. Top tips. We like top tips. So, yeah, brilliant. I mean, I am conscious that you've got, you know, you've got flowcharts to finish. I know. I just, I just love a flowchart. <laughs> flowchart. Um, <laughs> and yes, we know there is obviously plenty we could be talking about uh, and you know we you know i'm sure i'm going to get off a holly up and say she'll be delighted to talk to anybody if you've, and you've got any questions so yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely I, yeah if I mean, hello we'll circulate my contact details i'm sure uh, with the um link to this absolutely um yeah and so yeah and you know i, I think the, you know, the important thing is, is is to get out there that you know we are not working, you know, it's, it's like very corporate speak. We don't work in silos. We can't work in silos. This stuff's big. This stuff's messy. This stuff is very open to interpretation. And it's finding the right people to do the right job is, is crucial. And, and you know, the, I, I, as those who know me know, I don't touch health and welfare stuff. It's like it's a whole different dark mystery art in the court mm. of protection. You know, it's, not only like you know as holly says the the court cases are such that you know you don't necessarily have the authority to do so but the health and welfare world is completely <laughs> serious but we know people who are great at it <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's it and if we can't do things i actually had a case come in the other day and i just said and it was about um a care home dispute about contact in the world of covid and i just thought you know i'm not the right person for this and i referred it to my lovely friend katie weber at ashford's because i just thought she's the right person to deal with this because because actually the government are putting out loads of updates in terms of COVID contact and sort of yeah. like what the care homes should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. I thought I'm, it, I could get up to speed on this, but I'm at the moment not up to speed on this and they needed it sorting that week. So I thought, yeah. no, let's just get it done, you know, send it off to someone who's better than me at that. And actually that's that's the right thing to do, I think, for our clients. So Absolutely. So I have a list of things to send out to people. So, um, you know, if anybody wants anything, just, you know, in particular that we've talked about today, drop me a line. I'm sure we, we can certainly pass that on. Um, and a huge thank you to you, Holly. And uh, I'm admiring yeah, your you shed. I'm me. admiring your office come shed. I know. Well, it's not a shed. I mean, we call it a shed, obviously. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very nice home office. Um, very nice super honest being married to an author. You make no money being married to an author at all. But <laughs> they have a really nice office that you can steal when lockdown happens. It's, it's I, 50/50. ideal ideal yeah. okay well <laughs> splendid well thank you very much and thank you um yes i shall no doubt speak to you soon and uh thank you everybody for coming thank you bye bye